Uh, thanks, everyone. I have ha I have the best session ever. I mean, it's after lunch, right? So. Please, we have an amazing panel here. They're all excited. We already had a few breakups, makeups, arguments, love quarrels. Honestly, nothing to do with love. It's all to do with the money, right? No, it's not to only to do with the money. It's to do with communities. I mean, the topic might be climate financing and humanitarian action and looking at the gap, but it's about how do we really get... Um, our c the communities we serve in, especially in the humanitarian sector, to uh, where we are working in conflict contexts, fragile contexts, where they are already the hardest to reach, and we as humanitarians are there. How are we going to manage in this particular environment we are living in, where climate change impacts are increasing, uh, where we are already facing hardships with drought? We heard today from Taiba. We will hear today from Azmat, uh, who's from Pakistan, what it is like, and then what has to happen next, and is it possible for us to, uh, you know, what can we do as a humanitarian sector, and how do we need to mobilize action? Um, where do I need to point to do this? Sorry. Oh, it's good. Perfect. Voila. <laughs> Merci. Um, all right, so I just wanted to give a little insights into numbers, but before I get to that, because numbers are boring sometimes for us, can I have a round of hands of who is, who knows about climate financing? One, oh, not too bad. Okay, Pamala. Uh, and who is, who has no idea about GEF, um, what are the, what, GCF, GEF, all of these, you know, acronyms. We know CBPF and CERF and all these other things, right? Yeah, we know those, but we, okay, we have a, a few of those too. But there's only, what? You don't know either. Is it? Okay, all right. we have we have an interpreter going, we don't know either, so perfect. Exactly. <laughs> this is exactly what it is. We're trying to break down what what is what does this mean to a certain extent. So just to kind of give a bit of perspective of where we are coming from. And as you can see, in, in the context that we work in, there's, there's quite a big amount of, you know, 119 million people that are in high intensity conflict, most of the places where we are there, socioeconomic fragility, and COVID hasn't helped, economic, you know, crisis around the world hasn't helped, and then there's climate crisis and vulnerability to climate impacts. This is a big chunk, and this is exactly most of the places where we're working in. And I think one slide is missing, but that's okay. Have I missed a slide? Ah, there, yes, exactly. And, and maps are always interesting. I'm very bad at geography, but one thing that is quite clear is on the left we see is where the high vulnerability and risk for climate changes and you know we see like where we are working and is on the right hand side which is 24.2 people million in need where we are working in they all look the same except for maybe few countries and don't ask me which countries because i told you i'm bad at geography but um, at, at least you see that there are these you know there are similarities exactly where we are working so what does that mean for us, right? And oh, and then we've been talking about financing. Today we heard about you know, um, uh, where is there opportunities to access climate financing? And this is a conversation we're going to have today. What is climate financing in the first place? So we see a bit of the climate financing we're seeing is the climate change adaptation. There's DRR, Disaster Risk Reduction Funding, that's going into con context, and there's humanitarian funding, and this is um, a percentage, which is less than 20% of the total 222 billion of ODA that is, you know, it was for 2021, I think. Thanks to DI for, for the statistics, I might not be doing justice to this. But the gray, half of the gray ball you see is the total ODA, but the percentage going to humanitarian climate adaptation DRR is extremely minimal. And this is also, imagine where we're working in, it's ex even less so. And we will have our speakers talking about that as well. 
And I think from here, we don't need to talk about the funding gap. That's even clearer. We've been talking about that the whole day. So from, from this, I'd like to actually go down to really understanding what does it mean at ground level, at country context, and this is where Azmat, you come in. <laughs> Good luck. Um, Azmat comes in. Uh, to, to kind of ground our conversations, why are we really talking about funding? And this is the same question we heard earlier. And why are we talking about climate funding or climate financing? We've had Pakistan that's been hit so many times now, twice by floods. And maybe just with this particular visual that we see, what does that mean, Azmat, to you? And what does that mean to them? Over okay. to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a very good afternoon. Uh, because Nishani has set the example already by asking you to raise hands, so I, I would just like to to see the raised hands of those people who know that Pakistan faced a flood in 2022. So how many of the people have? So, yes. So thank you so much. Like you all know uh, that we faced this flood. And some of you might be working there uh, with your organization, some of you might be sort of working through partners. And flooding is not a phenomenon which is quite new for us and we don't know how to respond to it. So every year, or if not every year, we get flooding on every second or third year and we get riverine flooding. So in 2022, we had all the readiness plans, we had the preparedness, we even had the mock drills in some areas and uh, giving an example from this hall. So we were expecting that the flood is coming in this area, in the front row of this hall. So all we were all prepared. And that part of the hall, which is on the back, we never received rains over there. But the flood started from there. So this 2022 floods, it was a typical climate change phenomenon which we, which we saw in uh, our country. Uh, there was a sort of a bit of speed because the floods came in July and the first flash appeal was launched by the UN and the government in August. Uh, but the size of the appeal and the real needs on ground uh, during, like according to rough estimates, the damages were of about 30 billion US dollars and appeal was launched for $216 million. And uh, we tried to criticize the, the appeal that the needs on ground are so immense and uh, those people who are launching the appeal, so there, there was sort of a political game going on. The UN wanted the government to feel good about them that this is, this is a government-led response. And, uh, we as civil society, we knew the real needs and we were asking the UN system to activate the clusters, even activate the country best pool fund, but the, the UN system wanted the government to feel good about themselves. This is a government-led response and we are not activating clusters. And you can see from this graph, 33 million people were affected. 82 districts were affected. And the UN appeal, with, which is now revised, it is something like 500 million. It is addressing 4.5 million people. So when, when I looked, when I came here, and I looked to the hall, so I just wanted to to visualize this. Like, uh, just consider that we haven't had lunch yet. It is the lunch time. There are 13 rows in this hall. And we ask that, okay, three people from the row number three, two people from the row number five, seven people from the row number eight, they are going to have lunch because we have a limited amount of lunch and the remaining can stay here. So that is exactly what has happened in Pakistan. Like 33 million people have, have been affected. They have lost their... Uh, uh, their houses, their livelihoods, but because the the UN and the government wanted to to have a good good image worldwide, and 
there was a fear. To be honest, let, let, let us be honest among ourselves, we as a humanitarian community. Now, me as a local actor and the international NGOs and you and we, I, I consider all of us as one community. But the decision makers in our communities thought that though the needs are quite big, we need a huge funding, but there are competing emergencies and then there is one, one sort of, uh, I, I'm trying to find a good word, but, but anyway, a, fav a favorite emergency which the donors want to fund and we will feel sort of embarrassment if we, if we ask for, for the real needs. And uh, the thing is like out 83, 83 districts were hit by the flood and the appeal which is launched is addressing needs only in 22 districts. So if I am a person or if I am a family who has lost their house, who has lost their livelihoods and everything, but I belong to a district which is not in the prioritized list. So I'm not going to get assistance. Uh, even like going further deep, the appeal was launched once in Pakistan and then uh, next time in Geneva and the donors split like uh, around 60% pledges were made uh, during the, the launching time. But it is like less than 30% uh, funded now. And uh, we have been hearing in, in, in the uh, various panels that even if the funding has reached, we don't know like when it will reach the places where it is needed. Now, uh, those of you who know about the the geography and topography of Pakistan, this was the flood which like there are steep areas in the northwest and the western part, so the, the flood water never stood there. It came, it flashed and it damaged the, the houses and the infrastructure and, and it went down to the plain areas and in the plain areas and parts of Sindh, it is still standing, the, the flood water is still standing. So as humanitarian community or professionals, we were expecting that this time we will be having a response, some of which will be the early recovery in those areas where water is not standing. In some areas where the water is standing, it will be typical life saving and all those things. But as, as humanitarian community, the CNN effect took over us. Uh, because if an area is already devastated, but floods, flood water is not standing there, so the TV cameras cannot capture it. But if flood water is standing somewhere, the TV cameras capture it good and your TV channel gets ranking that you are showing it. And as a humanitarian organization, if, if you are moving along the, the, the flood water, wherever the flood water is going and the cameras can capture it, so, so you do respond there. And those areas where there is no more flood water standing, they got out of the radar of the humanitarian community, the international community. And this is it. Uh, now, uh, the RNA, the Rapid Need Assessment and PDNA, they, they both sort of started over there. Because I'm representing the local actors' voices, so, the data collection process, even the logistics arrangement, if, if uh, I don't have the exact figures, but, but rough estimate is like the data collection process, the human resource, the vehicles, and all these things, like more than 50% of it was funded by the local actors themselves. They gathered their own resources, they, they, they put the data over there. But once the appeal is launched and the funding is coming, we as local actors, we don't know like whether those people who have really carried out those need assessments and the local actors, like the, the local actors are not like this, that the local NGOs are in some, some place which is immune to, to flooding. So many of our own staff members, our board members, they, they were affected by, by the flood themselves. They have lost their houses and they have lost their assets. And 
despite that, we as local actors, local humanitarian community, we tried our level best to, to contribute to this rapid need assessment. We, we deployed our own staff, we deployed our own resources, logistic resources, but we don't know that whatever amount of funding is being mobilized as, as a response of those rapid need assessment, how much of it will be reaching the, the people. So for me, climate change is not just an issue which I read in a newspaper I, or I listen to, to in uh, on a, a news channel. This is a reality which we are living every day. And as a community, I, I feel embarrassed that uh, I, cannot, I cannot respond to the real needs of my community and ground because I don't have access to the resources which are needed to respond to their needs. Thank you. Thanks, Azmat. Azmat, I have a quick question, follow up. I mean, I, I don't have to repeat your points, but one of the things that you said, you know, Pakistan has been in cyclical, you know, flood situations because of the nature of, you know, where it's placed, you know, with, with climate impacts increasing. We had a bit of a information here that we, you know, got was on how much of funding had gone into DRR, climate change adaptation in 2011, and then before in 2021, just so that we understand, look at, I think the, the numbers say quite a bit of it, that there is very minimum adaptation funding, DRR funding that's gone into for preparedness. And then of course the response obviously is big because the impacts are huge, we saw them out. And even this, this is a, a minute amount of, you know, the needs that we see and the amount of funding that's gone into this. When we had this conversation in 2020 on our webinar and our learning stream about the, you know, the little work you were doing with the little amount of funding you were getting in these remote areas with communities that were most vulnerable, you know, how how much of that um, of that support that you your organization and these local organizations are doing in minute you know, little pilot projects because you're finding out, oh, this is what's required. And, and you can explain a little bit the, the program, but how can we scale this up? And is there a way that is, you know, do you feel that this, this sort of scaling up is important to make sure that, that people are, you know, less vulnerable, that they are prepared? And have you seen some sort of, you know, uh, productivity of this particular programs that you were doing? Over. Thank you so much, uh, Nishani, and uh, for, for, for the benefit of those people who don't know what Nishani is talking about and what, because we you had... You need to watch the learning <laughs> yes. stream, guys, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but for those people who don't uh, know, so I, I will try to sort of summarize the, the intervention. We do, do have uh, a program in Pakistan which was basically on the livelihoods revival for the returnee IDPs and uh, uh, United Nations World Food Program is supporting us in that. And initially we, we proposed an intervention of the nature-based solutions uh, for disaster risk reduction. And to, to put it in simple words, we, are, we do try with the nature-based solutions to, to reduce the velocity of the flash floods from the areas where the floods begin from. And these areas are exactly those areas which are having issues with the declining underground water. So that intervention increases the absorption of the flood or rainwater to underground water, so we do have a bit of water available to our coming generations. And this same, like this, uh, reduces the velocity, so when the floods reaches the plain areas, it causes less damage. Uh, that is uh, a thing which we have piloted and uh, it has sort of uh, very positive results in the areas where we have had this, this uh, program. But to give you an overall picture, like the, the area of Pakistan is around 796,000 square kilometers. And we could work only in around 
10, 11, 15 square kilometers, rather less than that. But the thing is, uh, it has been piloted and it works. Now the question is of priorities. And the question of priorities is for Pakistan as a country, but this is also a question for us, the human beings, not the humanitarian community. All the human, climate change is a thing which is not like uh, Ignacio said in, in the morning that the COVID-19 actually proved this fact that there is no corner on the earth where we can hide from certain things. And climate change is one of that thing. So the, the message for us is that this, that intervention, it could be replicated not just in Pakistan, but in other areas where we do have this problem. And this sounds quite, quite contradictory. When, when I used to tell people that in Pakistan, in the part of Pakistan where I am working, we do face the water scarcity or the water shortage over there, and our second problem is the floods. And the same people would think on the back of their mind, what the hell this guy is talking about? They have less water, but they have floods. So with that intervention, that is a nature-based solution, and we are, we are trying to use some of the flood water and channel it, sort of inject it uh, to the ground so that our coming generations do do have access to the clean drinking water, which is uh, the, the aquifer over there. Uh, it could be scaled up, it could be replicated, but it again, it requires resources. And uh, when the resources are not available, so this is just an intervention, we have done it and we have written reports and it's there. Thanks. Thanks, Asmat. I think this is, I think, one of the, the key things we're seeing is in, in many contexts, we are working across the board on looking at how do we improve the lives of communities better, right? And some of these uh, programs naturally evolve to see what is there on the ground, what is the requirement, what's the needs of communities, and to see how are we then changing our programs, looking at the context, especially taking into consideration climate impacts. And even with the little amount of funds you're getting with humanitarian funding, you're revising programs to look at DRR, looking at you know water tables and, and changing the way we're working. And if we can do it in this scale, we can do it bigger. And I'm going now to Charlene, I think, to look at the scales of climate financing and what does that really mean? Um, Climate financing to, I think, many of us, uh, honestly to me, even having, you know, started learning more and more about climate change working in humanitarian contexts and trying to raise awareness about it even among our membership, our, 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 uh, our staff, everybody, it's still uh, a, a bit of a beast to me. So maybe you can help us a little bit unpack what is climate financing? Where is the money? Who gets the money? <laughs> Thanks, Nishani. There was a time when climate finance didn't exist, the term, we didn't think about it. In theory, in future, if all of our decision making, whether we're investing or financing, has climate risk as its heart, doesn't you know, emit more and takes into account physical impacts, it would just be finance. It won't be climate finance anymore. We'll be in a low emission, climate resilient world. That's not very helpful right now. So historically, uh, in theory, climate finance takes into account anything that delivers a mitigation action, so removing emissions or lowering emissions um, and making people more resilient to the impacts of climate change. So this is mostly mitigation and adaptation. At present, it mostly excludes the addressing of losses and damaging damages as a result of climate change. So those things that were unavoidable or unavoided as a result of climate change. There is a more narrow definition that most people are familiar with in some sense or form, and that's the commitments made by developed countries to provide finance for developing countries as a result of their historical responsibilities for climate change. And you may have heard of the 100 billion goal, so 100 billion a year by 2020 being provided from developed to developing countries. However, there's no strict definition of what counts. So who pays? Does it count if it comes from the private sector? 
Who receives it? Does it count if me as a researcher living in Geneva gets the money, or is it only when it lands in a developing country? And in what format is it provided? Does it only count if it's a grant, or can I give you equity to help develop a business? So I think there's lots of debates about what really counts to climate finance. What's clear from this slide is that all of the flows that we can count are much less than the needs that are being articulated. So the, the, top, the top dotted line is a needs estimate, and that was by Stern, Songwei, and others just before COP that said we need one trillion a year in emerging markets, and this excludes China, to hit a 1.5 degree target. And that was mostly focused on mitigation, so avoiding the climate changing any further. Um, and of course, there was uh, more, more needs if you included developed countries within that. Another report was the Needs Determination Report that was under the UNFCCC, so that's the Convention on Climate Change. Uh, and they costed, they tried to cost national development, uh, na nationally determined contributions to climate change mitigation, some of which included adaptation needs, and they got about 0.7 trillion a year by 2030. The solid lines show what we are being able to count right now. So the Standing Committee on Finance, which again is another body under the UNFCCC, estimated there's about 803 billion a year flowing in total climate finance. This means also in developed countries. So primary investments, whether it's infrastructure or otherwise, that are mitigating and adapting to climate change all around the world adds up to about 800 billion. And the OECD, again, just before uh, uh, they're updating their reports every year, but there's a bit of a time lag in the data. So they have estimated that the finance that's mobilized and provided by developed countries for developing countries is currently around 83 billion a year. So by all accounts and purposes, this falls well below the needs that we see. And I just want to pause for a second and say we're talking about quantitative needs in terms of dollar figures, but there are a number of qualitative needs that need to be taken into account as well. It's much harder to cost how you need to reform your fiscal policies, your taxes, your subsidy regimes. It's much harder to cost how to do capacity building, uh, financial inclusion, and things like that. So these are off, we, we have a tendency to cost the hard things, the hard infrastructure, the pieces that we can estimate much better. Um, so yeah, just, just to say that there are other principles that guide climate finance. So uh, there's supposed to be a balance between adaptation and mitigation. In general, we see a bit of a bias towards mitigation. Uh, we need to prioritize small island developing states, least developed countries, because they are the most vulnerable to climate change. And of course, we, we should finance in respect of human rights uh, and in, in pursuit of sustainable development as well. Shall I continue into how does it flow? Well, I think one of the questions is where does it flow, right? And to who does this money go to? And, and we'll come back to the question afterwards on, you know, but go ahead, yeah. Okay, so um, in terms of how does it flow, we know a lot more about the climate finance that flows from developed to developing countries because they are more transparent. So we are biased towards picking apart the flaws of these particular flows because we can see them better. So there's a big lack of clarity about what private finance is going towards adaptation. So we don't know when companies have contingency plans for a flood, uh, or maybe they have their own insurance schemes. We're not counting those because we don't have clarity on those. This is a table that looks at the flows from, mostly the flows from developed to developing countries, and it looks predominantly at multilateral climate change funds. So these are the funds that are established either under the, the convention and the Paris Agreement, or in relation to it, uh, the uh, Green Climate Fund, which is the biggest uh, climate change funds, and I think it has pledges of about 18 billion right now. There's the, the Global Environment Facility, the Adaptation Fund, least there's, there's a lot of funds which is the problem, and they all add up to a relatively small amount of money, which you can see here is around three billion as an annual average. These funds uh, do tend to have a better balance between adaptation and mitigation, and cross-cutting just means that it supports both adaptation and mitigation. Uh, and they're also very grant-based, so they're really, in a sense, the most risk-taking, and they can get to the most vulnerable and meeting kind of immediate needs of responding to the impacts of climate change. Bilateral, similar, it's higher. This is mostly what's going through uh, the OECD DAC, the bilateral provision. Although it's worth noting here that the developing country label is not the same as what is an ODA eligible country. 
So there are some middle income countries, high income countries that are not necessarily, uh, sorry, that high income countries that are not necessarily eligible for ODA that would be eligible for climate finance. Um, and maybe just a last note on this is that the, the multilateral development banks tag climate finance. They obviously have the biggest of the flows that are mentioned here, but most of them go to mitigation. These are generally larger projects that have less problem of aggregating kind of smaller needs with respect to adapting to climate change. And these are mostly as concessional loans or even just uh, non less concessional loans, let's say, equity, guarantees, so on and so forth. Um, access is very, very complicated. <laughs> I think that's where you want me to go, so I'm gonna preempt that question. Um, is that the next slide? Yeah, there you go. It's really not easy to access these funds, and these funds take many years in many cases to access. This is a graph that shows over the last kind of 20 years how access to the major multilateral climate change funds, so I'm talking just about that three billion, have, uh, have evolved. And at the beginning, most of this funding went through multilateral and international agencies, whether it's uh, MDBs or uh, UN uh, or other international NGOs. Over time, we have been adding regional and national entities. A large part of that has been the Green Climate Fund that has made a conscious effort to accredit uh, national entities in order so that they can receive finance. But this is a very invasive process where they look at fiduciary responsibilities. Can you really manage this money? How are you, how, what does your governance look like? And all of these processes take a lot of time. So it can take years to get accreditation to the Green Climate Fund. And that's before you even make any application to have a project. So it's very complicated to access these funds. It's neither quick nor easy. It's incredibly costly. And uh, I, I think what I want to say with access is that, it, you know, this is the three billion. It's not just access to the climate funds that's important. It's access to capital markets. It's access to money more broadly. It's access to those trillions that you sort of, the needs that you see on that initial graph. Um, if you don't have, you know, if your credit rating at a sovereign level is terrible, how are you going to access the capital markets? If you don't have revenue raising capacities, how are you going to, you know, create a social protection system? So we really must think about access to climate finance in a much broader sense than just the climate funds. So basically what you're saying is it's worse than the humanitarian sector. <laughs> yeah, kind of, sound of. So I'm not from the humanitarian sector, so I couldn't possibly answer that question. But what I wanted to say is that it's very, very political. Mm. And climate finance uh, will always will be and has been political because humanitarian sector is, but from my understanding, more based on a moral responsibility. Whereas climate finance is on a historical responsibility as well. And that's where it gets complicated because we have no formula of allocating historical responsibility. Thanks. Yeah, I think the, the fact is that funds go to governments, basically, either through, mostly through the, you know, either directly or through multilateral uh, bank, uh, the MDBs, the UN agencies, and it's very rare that it goes to anyone who is local, you know, NGOs, very rarely is what I'm getting from this, this Yes, it, it, we are improving the system so that it can get to entities that are either subnational, regional, local. It's hard because they often need a, a relatively small amount of money to make impact. And something like the MDBs find it very difficult to give small amounts of money and because of the transaction cost of doing that. So we absolutely have a failure in getting it to the local level, to the people that could determine what they need for adaptation the best because of huge transaction costs and difficulties in getting accredited, absolutely. And I'm going to talk to, get uh, Catherine Lun to expand a little bit more on that. And why are we especially talking about gaps in climate financing and gaps in humanitarian financing and, and the context we work in? Catherine Lunds with ICRC, and I'm sorry, I should have said Charlene's with ODI, but all of you have everyone, uh, all the speaker briefs and their backgrounds. Catherine Lun, what's the problem? What are we facing here? <laughs> Thank you, Nishani. Thank you, Charlene. That was extremely enlightening. I have questions for you afterwards. What's the problem? So I, I, I'll switch this around because obviously we're coming at this from... Just your mic over. We're coming at this from the perspective of 
people we work with. So what are they facing? I work for the ICRC, which means that I, we work with conflict-affected communities and violence-affected communities. When I look at climate change and climate vulnerability, what I see is that the communities we work with, and we saw that on one of your maps, and it's further exacerbated when I'm looking at conflict, what we're seeing is the communities that we work with are among the most vulnerable to climate change. If I look specifically at conflict-affected communities, what I see is that the top of the list in terms of vulnerability and weaker capacity to adapt or readiness to adapt to a changing climate is conflict-affected communities. If I expand that group a little to the 25 countries on the top of the list, I come with 25% with 60% uh, of countries that are entering conflict. So what we have there is acute vulnerability of countries entering conflict to growing climate risks. Now, why is that? This does not speak of causality between climate change and conflict. So these are not countries in conflict because climate change has caused conflict in these countries. These are countries that are extremely vulnerable because of the weakness of their institutions, because of the weakness of social cohesion in countries entering conflict, because of the weakness of the economy, and so on and so forth. So what we're looking at is the disruptive impact of conflicts on societies. This means that if I'm looking at what is needed in these communities and what are the impacts, well, on the one hand, the impact of growing climate risks is felt on all dimensions of people's lives. So on their health, on their economic security, on their access to food, on their access to water, and so on and so forth. And there I'm breaking no news to anyone in this room. It does mean that there is a need for supporting adaptation in terms of farming methods in terms of access to water, in terms of, of adapting health systems, and so on and so forth, in places where that support to adaptation is extremely weak. Now, if I look at the situation of these people, and I look at pledges in terms of supporting the most vulnerable to adapt to a changing climate, or if I look at pledges under the Agenda 2030, i.e. leave no one behind, have a complete mismatch between the situation of these people, people we all work with in a way or another, and where support is going. And that very much connects with a number of the points that Charlene was flagging in terms of the complexity of climate finance and where it goes and where it doesn't go. So what we see, and I'm being overly simplistic, but I'm not distorting the reality, what we see is that the most vulnerable a place is, the most fragile a place is, the less it receives support for climate adaptation. So the less money flows to these communities. Now I'm mostly looking at the climate funds here. And you're absolutely right that we would need to be looking at other funding going to these communities. But if we're taking climate funds as an indicator of where money is going, what we see is a significant gap in climate finance reaching conflict-affected communities and more broadly fragile communities. It's just more acute in um, conflict-affected communities. We understand that imbalance between the need and what is being provided in these settings to be explained by a number of, so you've alluded to this in terms of the complexity of the funds. There's also an extreme risk aversion of a lot of these funding mechanisms because ideally you want to invest in something where you have some sort of security that it will yield results. Now we know that investing in conflict settings is a riskier investment than investing in a more stable setting. So there's a risk dimension. There's very much a dimension of how the overall funding architecture is siloed and is not always helpful when it comes to directing the right type of support to communities. So we have financing operating in isolation in terms of humanitarian financing, development financing, climate financing, and that does not help to redirect or to direct money where it should go. We're also looking at the administrative modalities of the fund. So you've mentioned the complexity of getting accredited, but it goes down to questions such as in which language do you have to submit your accreditation? in English. For a number of countries, that is complicated. So we're dealing with countries with extremely limited capacity. Now, the other complication here is we work with communities who can be quite 
disenfranchised, who sometimes live on territories that are not under the control of the state. And because most of these mechanisms are supporting states at a central level, money does not tend to trickle down to communities. And you've alluded to money trickling down, and this is acute in conflict settings, because a government is less likely to be supporting activities in areas not under its control or in areas that are extremely weak. So there we have a plethora of problems that when these are put together lead to a very limited support in conflict settings where the needs are particularly acute. Okay, <laughs> right, so already we're finding funding trickling down to humanitarian issues, already humanitarian funding being, you know, as it is quite low in most of the contexts we're working. We have a huge funding gap, it's already 44%. On top of that, when we're talking about long-term resilient building, when we're talking about conflict context resilient building, if it's meant to be, you know, already prevention and a bit of that preparedness levels that need to take place with adaptation coming in, in contexts that are most vulnerable, there's almost nothing going in, is, it seems like what we're hearing. And are there any countries, do you know, between the two of you who may have even managed to get some of this funding for adaptation? Yes, you do have conflict-affected countries receiving climate finance. It's just that the proportions are inadequate. But I would not say a no to that question because there is funding for adaptation going to extremely fragile countries, but not in the proportions that are required. You were asking a question about the support in these locations. We also need to take into account that you have other sources of support. And this is where I was alluding, for instance, to humanitarian funding that will often reach these most vulnerable communities. The challenge is that it's not sufficient and that you need development support and you need climate money reaching these communities. But there is definitely, I mean, most of us would know that we work in settings where there is at least support for humanitarian action. Never at the right level, but money is reaching some yeah. of these communities. The, the other thing to take into account there is the question of the most local actors. And you were alluding to that, Amzad, because that's very much one of the other obstacles with the funds is that, I, I was mentioning governments, but the smaller scale action struggles to be supported. And I think just picking up on that, I'd like to go to um, Sylvie. You know, we're looking at in, in context where we're working, we see multiple crises hitting and we talked about this multiple crisis aspect the risk reduction, the food, you know, the resilience piece and the food security piece is something that comes up with climate change all the time. We, ha we heard that in, in East, the East Horn of Africa. We heard that in the Horn of Africa. We heard about Ethiopia, Somalia context from today in the morning on conversations where the Ethiopian government was not able to get funding because of the fact that they were not able to access it. Uh, it's not the same as how the Somali government would have accessed it. What is you seeing in your, when you're working as FAO, you're working across a few of these nexuses, right? Um, what are your impressions and how are we looking at, you know, across the board, how, this, is there a, a aspect of what we need to do better? Thank you, Nishani. It's a pleasure to be with all of you here this afternoon. Um, I'm an agronomist. I'm working in FAO. I have a resilience hat, I have a humanitarian hat, I have a development hat, and more recently, I think I can add a climate hat. Well, um, it makes me uh, speaking maybe adding more complexity, um, which I don't really want to do. <laughs> but it's just to say that if you take the climate crisis, I'm very happy to speak after our eloquent colleagues here. If you take the climate crisis, with, I think some of us understand more or less the climate crisis, the climate change as its own jargon, its own uh, taxonomy, its own negotiation, its own convention, its own funding. It does not really welcome the humanitarian actors because very often humanitarian actors are saying like wanting to grab the money and being quite efficient at doing that. 
So we've been, in fact, as humanitarian actors, we've been even pushed away from the climate discussion. But now maybe there's room for us to come on board. And I think um, Martin Griffith this morning pointed to that, saying that COP27, collective voice from humanitarian action was missing. And perhaps in this COP28, we're going to have more chances for humanitarian voice to be there because it's in the humanitarian hub in Dubai, right? But coming back to the uh, food security, we also have, in addition to the climate crisis, not surprisingly, a food crisis. A uh, food crisis, we all know, food production is very much linked to climate and um, very much weather dependent. And we have in most um, developing countries, about 70 or 80% of the people have agriculture-based livelihoods. So the big actors and change engine in climate change and in climate risk management and disaster risk management and so on are some of these smallholders, um, a farmer, livestock, uh, herder, fish farmer, uh, fishers, uh, tree dependent communities and so on. So this is why I'm saying I'm adding complexity because to the whole climate issue, we're just bringing the whole food, agriculture, food security, malnutrition, hunger issue. And again, taking a system approach, which means that we're, we're moving now, especially with the Food System Summit, has been putting food system on the agenda. Okay, it's food system. Yes, that means we're talking from producing food to the consumption of food. That's the system approach. And linking the, the, the production to the consumption in the analysis and the solution that we're trying to put forward. Um, and I'm saying all this because also um, the energy is perhaps the biggest um, solution for the climate crisis, but the food is perhaps ranking as the second one. The way we produce and we consume food today is part of driving the climate crisis. And for all of us as humanitarian actors, working most vulnerable, at-risk people on the front line, we're dealing with some of these communities with agriculture-based livelihoods and who are victim of a, a, a broken uh, food system that is not meeting uh, and helping them meet, meet their needs. Now, to come to the solution, uh, food, food is, is part of the solution because it can, if we're doing correctly, it can capture in the climate mitigation, not impact mitigation, climate mitigation, which is uh, sequestrating uh, greenhouse gas emission. The forest, the soil, the ocean, it can capture 30% of the greenhouse gas emission. But that money, it's not for the developing countries, that's the mitigation focus. We are looking for the adaptation and the resilience work. Adaptation and resilience, these are also silos, these are separating us. As humanitarian, we talk better to the resilience. The climate actors talk better to the adaptation. For resilience, you need to be able to respond to the, to the crisis and the climate-related disasters. But again, we are silo. We are on another level. I'm just sort of paraphrasing some of the, of the points that were mentioned by all of us here. So what I'm trying to say here is that um, if you put together the, the, the issues at the climate crisis, the food crisis, the food crisis is dominantly uh, happening in protracted, fragile situations that are taking up to 77% of the funds, uh, humanitarian funds. And this is where we find the, the acute food insecurity situation. And these are the people that receive the least, the climate finance. And, and this is where we have a problem. And again, because they are the least contributing to the climate crisis. So the, the taking the climate and the food crisis all together, you can see that it's, there is really this dramatic situation in this fragile, protracted crisis situation. And this is what the COP28 wants us to focus on. Bringing more finance, climate finance, but all type of finance and climate action to those protracted uh, crisis situation 
especially um, through uh, agriculture and food security uh, support, bringing all, all this uh, together. So here, sorry I'm being a bit long, but I'm trying to connect the, the climate, the food, the, the hunger, um, and, and bringing us the, the solution is really for us to work together. We can no longer have a tagging of one type of action. I'll tell you an example. Providing um, drought tolerant crop seeds var variety in a location, or, or it can be in your, well, I was not going to say Pakistan because we were under flood, but you have some drought too. So providing that to one area, Depending on the situation, you can tag that as a humanitarian action, as a resilience action, as a DRR action, as a climate adaptation action, as a development action. Is this useful? And, and that's together with the finance. So we are tagging and siloing the action and the funding. So in this protracted crisis situation, where we have conflict and humanitarian situation going on for more than 10 years, we need to revisit the way we are working together, having one common programming and one sort of funding where we're tackling both the immediate, medium and longer term needs of the people, putting the people at the center. So reshaping, rethinking the way we work, whether it's for the food security or for the climate crisis. Thanks, I mean, that's the whole of the conversations we've been trying to to unpack a little bit on the humanitarian development, peace building, climate nexus, right? And on the ground, I think, Azmat, you know, and I know almost all our colleagues here, we've had these conversations yesterday. We were with, you know, um, we were in our member day and we had three topics that was a breakout session. One was climate, one was food security, one was access. And like some of the people are like, but we want to be in all the conversations because they are all important and because they are all connected and they're all interlinked. And it's the same conversations we're having. So, I mean, honestly, I don't have solutions for that. But one of the things we're seeing is, but on the ground, we see our communities, we see our NGOs who are working on the ground saying, we're not really siloing this because the needs are not siloed by communities. You know, a community doesn't say, oh, this is, my, this is my climate change need, can I have money from here? This is my humanitarian need, can I have some money here from here? It's my development need, can I have money here? No, it's these are my needs and they are varied. And at the different times, the needs are different, right? We, there's evolution. There's backward, you know, we go back to food, food insecurity and f food need, and then we go to, okay, livelihood, it's better, we, we improve, then we go back in, in between somewhere for, you know, early recovery, and then there's, it's a spectrum, especially if we're in conflict and fragile context and working in these places for protracted crisis for so long, it's a back and forth, back and forth all the time. And I think I want to touch on you, Isaiah, you kind of worked on a few siloed approaches. I mean, we talked about a systems approach, siloed approach here, but you've been in different hats. You've been in a you know, negotiating table with the government of Kenya. Now you're in an NGO, you're with you know, uh, Lutheran World Foundation, uh, Federation, sorry. I should know this better. But you're with LWF and what are you seeing when we're having these conversations in the same, you know, on different parts? You, you were the climate people, then now you're with the humanitarian sector. You kind of worked across the silos. Yes. And LWF works on development as well. So some insights from you would be useful. Thank you. Thank you, Nishani. And I think most members of ICVA actually might not be as strictly um, committed to one sector. Um, and are not the other. And I think this is important because of what I should say. In the, at the community level, this differentiation and this um, division does not ex exist. It is important to note, as well as has been noted by my colleagues, that um, climate change is not happening in isolation. It is happening in a context where um, there is fragility, there is poverty, uh, gender injustices, conflict, livelihood issues. And so it is really, really difficult to just think about climate change as this 
one clean square box that you can address with a couple of clean square answers. Um, but, but what I wanted to say in response to your question, Ishani, is that the entire climate change policy architecture has developed quite significantly. I think part of the reason we, we know quite a lot about it now is because over the last 50 years or so, there's been a very, very significant and systematic development of climate change policy. You can go back to Stockholm, you know, go into the convention in 92, look at Kyoto Protocol, come to the Paris Agreement, and all the pieces have sort of um, lined up in, in a relatively neat way, I must say. Um, architecturally or policy-wise, I think there is such a, a a robust, let me use that word, a ro robust presence of climate change processes under the convention, and it is possible to trace climate change in many, many different places. And I think this is important because it gives us language um, to, to, to address climate change holistically. Um, as I trace even that conversation back to the beginning, the way we understood climate change, if you look at Kyoto Protocol, the major understanding of climate change was um, something uh, to which we respond uh, with mitigation. So the focus was a lot around how do we cut emissions to, to reduce um, climate change. When you look at it right now, it's a lot more complex. And I think this is, it, 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 is, it is necessarily so because um, climate change is not easy, it's not simple, it's complex. And therefore, when we um, explore it from that complex perspective, it helps us to, to deal with it. However, this is how the silos have been developed. Um, it, it's, it's quite intriguing for me because if you, if you think about climate change as has been described by my colleagues, then there shouldn't really be just a Paris Agreement. There should be a more comprehensive um, approach, which I would say um, the global community has tried to do. Uh, you will see climate change uh, as part of the SDGs, SDG 13. You will see Sendai framework referring to climate change. Uh, within the human rights community, community now, there's quite a lot of conversations about that with the recent uh, declaration uh, and resolution of the GA and the Human Rights Council, respectively. So it is important to, to think about it that way. Um, my intervention, I think, would be related as well to considering then how we as humanitarians can come into the conversation. I feel like we are late into the conversation and I think it is, um, we need to catch up because climate change impacts are taking a very humanitarian uh, shape on the ground. And so when we think about how we respond to it, it would be important to see what we can bring uh, to the table. As we speak about climate change finance, and I, I appreciate what has been presented by my colleagues, I think um, recently the whole establishment of loss and damage as, as a thing um, in, in, in climate change policy, it is, we, we recognize it as, as an important pillar of climate action. So in addition to mitigation and adaptation, we consider loss and damage as the third and the most important and one of the, and, and as important pillar to respond to climate change. And the conversation having moved from establishing and understanding loss and damage and going to the question around how do we support it financially is significant. And so the decision at COP27 um, to establish a fund or to establish funding arrangements or to put together a mosaic of modalities to deal with um, financial aspects of responding to climate-induced loss and damage is important. And I think this, in my opinion, precisely is where humanitarian actors need to come in. Because as I said, a lot of the loss and damage, if you think about it the way it has been framed, it includes displacement, it includes things that are very disaster risk reduction in nature, which makes it extremely uh, relevant to, to us as humanitarians. Um, the silos don't just exist in policy, it exists as well in institutions. Um, if you look at my country, Kenya, climate change is handled probably by the Minister of Environment, The climate secretariat there. But when climate change happens in my country, it's part of the Horn of, of, of Africa, it's, it's, it's not the environmental people that deal with that. It will be special ministries or the office of the president and all, and all that. Within the UN, you will have UNDRR, you will have UN OCHA, you will have UNFCCC and all that. So institutionally, there are silos. 
So policy silos, institutional silos, and I dare say as well, the whole concept of strategic or visionary silos, the way um, Sylvia has, has presented quite well. Because I think if we think about responding to disasters or dealing with um, protecting people in communities, going down to those that are in vulnerable contexts, then we need a vision that looks at it a little more holistic. And so I think that is a silo that needs to be addressed. I will conclude my, my remarks by responding to a couple of things that have been said, which I found uh, particularly interesting. I think as the climate finance gap um, is quite importantly related to defining it, and I think that is really critical, as has been said. I think it is also related to mobili mobilizing it, which, is, which speaks to Availing the money, because I mean, a lot of the climate funds are empty. I, I am being dramatic here, but they're not filled with money. They, there isn't much money in there. And so much of the conversation about financing and climate funds need to still focus on, can we get the money so that when we talk about it, we're actually talking about real cash. And I think the third point is access, which has been uh, said, m mentioned clearly by my colleagues, but I would also um, say access also in terms of making the processes accessible. Applying for climate funds is not the same as applying for humanitarian funding where you stand up and say we are in need, help us. No, to apply for climate funding, you have to say who you are, where do you come from, how are you related to your government, and then they will come and say, do you have the capacity to handle this? By then, drought has swept the entire community. So that is something we need to look into, and I think there is, an, a, there is a need for us to think as well about how we can fight for access to um, humanitarian organizations or NGOs. This is a hot debate. I am, I am fully convinced that humanitarian organizations, humanitarian actors, NGOs need to have some kind of window that enables them to access funding to respond to climate disasters. Um, as I conclude, I just want to remind us um, of the way also um, addressing climate change has been defined, which I think is helpful. It's been defined in terms of finance, yes, but it's also been defined in terms of capacity building, and it has also been defined um, in terms of technology or technology transfer. So when you think about means of implementing climate action, it is not just money. It is how do we build capacities? Are there technologies that we can apply or uh, utilize uh, to respond to this to these things? So we mustn't also silo the money in a corner and imagine that you sort the problem just with money. It's a lot more com complicated and comprehensive than that. Thank you. And on that note, I think I totally agree. It's not only about the money, but it's show me the money is that, you know, who is that? Jerry Maguire was it? Show me the money. But anyway, I think I'm going to open this up. <laughs> I'm going to open this up for questions because we've heard a lot from our speakers. And I think it's quite, it is complex. There's a lot to unpack. And I'm not sure if we're going to do this in one session, obviously. I think this is the conversation we will continue to have to see how do we understand this better. But could I get some mics on the floor? Perfect, it's coming, yes. In the meantime, can I get some hands up? Does anyone have any questions? Wow. Oh, we have one, two, and three, okay. So I'm gonna start with Farida, whenever we get the mic to Farida, and it's coming. And then I will go to, um, yes, I'm coming to you too. Gentleman with the hand up, yes. Um, on that one, yes, and then to this lady here, and we will, I'm surprised I'm not getting much questions. Oh, we have one off the corner there. <laughs> all right, Farida, all yours. Thank you very much. A very thought-provoking uh, series of interventions. Um, I wanted to share a concern and a fear that um, we have as a humanitarian organization with a doubled mandate. Um, and also a question that I don't think we can answer today, but uh, it is part of our internal discussions. Um, I work for IRC, International Rescue Committee. Um, the concern uh, that we have now, especially after the establishment of the loss and damage uh, fund, <gasps> is that if we do consider climate change an emergency, and we should, um, some of the humanitarian funding may be diverted 
to go to this fund. So the fear is very real. How do we prevent that after decades of seeing humanitarian and ODA funding um, repackaged, represented at G20, G8, G7 summits as fresh new money, when in fact it's always the same. But there's a broader consideration I agree with, is a, uh, it's not just about the money. I mean, we have to ask ourselves why there is this institutional siloed approach, and that's because humanitarian aid really should abide by the four humanitarian principles such as impartiality, neutrality, independence, whereas development assistance, and even more, we heard from our ODI colleague, uh, climate finance, they are very political. Many donor agencies have different departments, different funding mechanisms to provide development assistance, which is often part of a broader foreign policy. So how do we reconcile the need to have this one um, programming approach, putting people at the center. I think we all agree in principle with what you said, uh, but in practice, how do we make it work safeguarding the four humanitarian principles? Thank you. Thanks so much. Not, not all easy questions, but can we have... Well, yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Great, thank you. Um, thank you for all of those contributions. Really useful. My name is Colin Burnham from the Irish NGO Trocra. Um, you almost all said something that I've been thinking for a while. Um, and Nishani, you were the closest to actually saying it, but nobody actually said it. And, and forgive me if there's a big groan that goes up in the room after I ask this question, but are we actually talking about a quadruple nexus? <laughs> okay, and... Um I am Noura from, uh, from Yemen, Arts Development Organization for Women and Child. Uh, first at all, really, really, this uh, opportunity for us as a Yemen is a good chance be, uh, to be here. Because as you know, in Yemen, uh, from eight uh, years, we more uh, facing more challenges in our countries. Based in this, uh, in, uh, this uh, subject, climate change, I want now to share with you small stories about climate change in, the, in Yemen. About the uh, Development Organization established since uh, 1996. Some more different uh, uh, next, uh, climate change facing and we work in climate change. But we, we want to mention for one information, important information. When we make intervention about the climate change from any donors must be, must be involved for the, the local or the community. Because, because the local NGOs or the community, they know what they need. And they know actually what the, in the field and the the in the with people some small stories we intervention with dkh donor new intervention in yemen fish farming in yemen this is the good uh, project for as you know based in the climate change in some season in the year i think from april to october the fishermen kind of lost the income generation because the climate impact in this uh, income they cannot reach the fish and the six, eight months still without income generation because we intervention in this project. We have mistake in this project when the design the project. We tie, we, when we design the project with the donor, we add some type for the fish because we uh, go on this intervention, uh, fish farming this time. But when go the implemented this uh, type for fish, we uh, stay with the community and fisher, uh, uh, fisherman. But suddenly this type for fish farming, we cannot fish our hair based in this climate change because the climate not matching with this uh, type for fish. Uh, a chance for us 
make a negotiation with the donor and really, really very, very thanks for our donor make more flexible. We change this project based what the community need and what the, can we development and we improvement our intervention and let us go another country, see what the type, see more studies, see more uh, exper experience in other countries and then update, uh, updated our project and then go through a, a chain, another uh, type for this fa farming. Let us, the fisherman, get, get income, uh, income generation uh, again. Thank you. Thanks so much. That, that really shows of how really we need to speak to our communities before we do any interventions in any program, not just only climate-related, I think, for anything, because we our communities know, and we rarely actually speak to communities before we decide and design. Um, let's just first take maybe these um, two questions. We have one more on the corner there. Yes, you have your mic? Yes. OK. Mic? Yeah, I have it. Sorry, who is this? Uh, Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, please do. Uh, well, thanks very much for sharing insights on this important topic. So I have two questions, and then I have two suggestions or points to make. Uh, firstly, like, does climate financing also cater to the root causes which is leading to climate change? And if yes, can we please have some examples? Uh, secondly, like these days, many donors are diverting funding to climate change. Uh, concern is that like without working on root causes, uh, without working on root causes, which is quite complex and is political, how wise it is to work on adaptation approaches and strategies uh, without like working on uh, the root cause. Um, I think that like climate financing should be additional and should not replace existing funding priorities. As otherwise, uh, like in medium to long run, it will create vacuum uh, in existing programming, which is also very much needed. Usually like NGOs work in small pockets. Like whenever we uh, respond to a disaster or even if we talk about development programming, uh, we work with like few thousands of families. So uh, like uh, uh, having a working approach of uh, uh, like uh, in small pockets, how viable the change which is required uh, can be achieved. So that approach, I think, also needs some more reflection. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm just going to go back to the panelists. Um, we had a few questions on diversion, um, worrying or concerns about you know, the um, uh, humanitarian principles, uh, working across development, uh, climate, which is highly political, um, quadruple nexus. <laughs> Shaheen, you said that before. The quadruple nexus as well, right? Oh, oh. she's like, oh no, don't, don't point fingers at me. <laughs> well, um, I think I'd like to first take those. Um, could I ask on principles, um, Catherine Lun, to give your perspectives, and I would then come to Azmat, and I'll be very specific to, to link two of those questions up. Thank you. Um, I have the slightly easier position to speak from an organization that has solely a humanitarian mandate and doesn't have a development mandate, which means that it's very clear for us that we need to preserve a space for a principled humanitarian action and that as much as we may contribute to development outcomes through our action, that we may help people adapt through our action to a changing climate and so on and so forth, we do not necessarily fall under the development plan of a government or a comprehensive climate adaptation plan. And of course, we think our action in light of what is beneficial for a country, which often will be framed under these documents. 
it does mean that we preserve or we try to preserve access to a space that may not be under the control of a government as well. And this is where I think it is very important to preserve that specificity of humanitarian action. It does mean we will operate in territories that are not under the control of a government, but under the control of non-state armed groups, for instance, where communities have very similar or acute Similar needs than the rest of the country in most cases, often even more acute because there would be limitations in terms of access to services and so on and so forth. There what I see in terms of tension is that we still need to be clear about what parts of humanitarian action may not fully fall under the coordination of a government when it comes to climate action or development action. There we need to preserve that humanitarian space. So it's principles of independence, it's principles of neutrality to be able to speak to all parties to a conflict. So that I would say we need to be careful in some of these conversations. And this to me also relates to the importance of being able to clarify what we as humanitarian actors can do when it comes to climate action and what we can't do. And I think there are a number of things that we cannot do because we don't have the expertise to do it in some cases. We don't have the footprint to do it. And there I think we have to be honest and realistic about what is it that we can do. And surely we can adapt our actions so it better meet the needs of communities. We should not contribute to maladaptation and so on and so forth. But I think we also need my slight concern in the humanitarian sector with this conversation is I think we are not putting boundaries on and I shouldn't call it boundaries, we're not that cognizant of where we're not experts in responding. And I, I completely agree with the points the two of you have made in, if you look at this from the perspective of a community, you will not silo needs. But as a humanitarian actor, I should be able to say on this one, I'm not the right one. Let me mobilize someone else, even if I received or I heard the community. So there I do think we need a bit of a clearer assessment of what is it that we are able to do versus what is it that we're not able to do. If I can add one thing, the guiding principle of humanitarian action, the first one on top of the hierarchy is humanity. So preserving humanity. And there I feel that we're not as a humanitarian community calling stronger enough for stronger mitigation. Because ultimately, we are focusing a lot on adaptation because we feel that this is where we might be able to do something. But if we keep destroying the planet and the environment, there's nothing I can do about it. So to some extent, I actually feel that as a group, if I'm looking at principles and I place the principle of humanity on the top of the hierarchy, I have to say we should be coming together to push for a much stronger political commitment when it comes to mitigation, even though I cannot do much about it beyond mobilization as a humanitarian actor. Thanks. Actually, Isaiah, I'm going to actually get you to answer the same question because dual, triple mandated organization, what, have, what are the conversations you're having within your organization about the same, you know, humanitarian principles, concerns about, you know, funding, etc.? I come around, I think everybody can touch upon this one. I would say yes. I think it's time to consider the quadruple nexus. I would say yes, but not yet. Because I think we haven't um, even discerned enough what the triple nexus looks like, and we haven't developed it um, into concrete understanding um, that could affect our sector. So I would, I would, I would definitely say yes, definitely quadruple nexus, absolutely, but not yet. I think we need to build the necessary pillars, as we've said. We need a stronger intervention and presence of humanitarian actors in the climate change space, and 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 so. That, that, that would be my response. But if you, if you allow me a second, because I'd like to, res to respond to the question about um, diverting uh, resources, funding uh, from humanitarian uh, work to, to climate action or from humanitarian work to loss and damage, I think it's a real threat, it's a real risk, and it becomes even worse if humanitarian actors are not part of the loss and damage conversation. The decision in Sharm al-Sheikh was, was 
to create a fund, but it was several decisions. One of them is related to developing modalities. In fact, part of that decision invited the Secretary General to convene a discussion with international financing institutions to figure out this. And for me, I think during the next few months when these modalities are being developed, it would be absolutely necessary for humanitarian actors to engage at that level. If we learn from history, ODA was diverted into climate finances. Um, in fact, some of it was diverted into loans and all sorts of things that put countries in really, really messed up situations. So I think this is a concern that we should have, but we should go beyond just the concern and go into real uh, proposals about how do we deal with this. And in my intervention, I think there is a lot that the humanitarian sector has learned and developed over the years that can be translated and can be almost forcefully injected into these conversations. And I would be happy to come, to come back um, to that later. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have? Yeah, go ahead. Let's Do hear from the climate people what they think. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the nexus question, you know, health is related to peace, is related to energy, is related to food. I, I don't think we can get away from that. It just is how it is. If we mitigate, we will have to adapt less. And if we adapt more, there will be fewer losses and damages that were unavoided and unavoidable. So I completely concur with that. And quite fundamentally, capital is capital. Finance is finance. And we've already said that on the ground, it doesn't matter what it's labeled. So I, I, I really kind of emphasize that. You know, we need, to, we need to think holistically about that. I wanted to kind of, uh, on, on this question of diversion and capturing, and I would urge us not to be competitive. And uh, I say it in the gentlest way possible. I hear a lot, only 4% of finance went to SIDS. Only 10% of finance gets to local level. But I rarely hear, I would like to see 15% of finance going to SIDS based on X, Y, and Z. We need to have X percent going to local level or because of these particular reasons. So I, I think we, it's about a narrative shift about how form follows function. So what do we need in which situations and who is best at serving that need? And what is the best financial instrument or modality or vehicle to suit that? And then coming back to the question about what, what, uh, how humanitarian actors can demonstrate what their role could be, the Green Climate Fund has uh, results management frameworks that are based on adaptation and mitigation, not on loss and damage. It has a number of accredited entities that you saw in that graphic that were accredited for their role in adaptation and mitigation. They are not necessarily accredited or have results management frameworks that are suitable for losses and damages. And that's where we can learn, what can you tell us about the best methods uh, for a slow onset event where insurance won't work? What can you tell us about the best, method, me best methods for getting for un to undocumented people that face the impacts of climate change? What are the concrete lessons that you have learned over generations that we can feed into loss and damage or any other pieces of the debates? So that's what I would say. I would say, like, we, you know, it's a narrative shift. Yes, it is competitive and it is political. And that's just, you know, but we can all work on this narrative about how we work together and, and find our places. Um, and then I just wanted to say as well that, you know, in addition to getting kind of supporting the need for mitigation and understanding that the, these things are interconnected, and I, I resonated what Sylvie said about how, you know, you, you end up picking up sectors, debates, topics, and you just kind of end up collecting them all, and sometimes it doesn't make it easier. And so I, I say this with, with some sense of uh, hesitation, but in, in the Sharm el-Sheikh decision text where we've talked about the loss and damage fund and funding arrangements, there was also a, a, a mention that the international financial system is not fit for purpose. And this relates to the fact that there are a number of countries in, with unsustainable debt. You know, there are countries that just do not have access to, to financial markets and they, you know, they, they, cannot, they cannot meet their sustainable development goals, uh, let alone think about their mitigation uh, pathways going forward. So again, I'm sure there's a role for the humanitarian sector to play in, in seeking a better international financial system. One that was currently built on colonialism and you know, uh, uh, IMF and World Bank that were built after the world wars. This is not, you know, that, that's not where we are now. Um, and there are a lot of lessons to be learned. So I, I do think um, at the risk of broadening everybody's expertise and trying to make everybody too thinly stretched, uh, we do need to look up sometimes. Thanks, go ahead, sir. 
Oh, Charlene, thank you. You give me some of um, a very nice chance to build on everything was said. And when you say change narrative, let's take from the nexus, the humanitarian peace development, you add climate actors, you also have to add the finance actors, okay? And we can go on, right? Qu at least five. But then you come in with the food, agriculture, energy, water, there's priority in this area. The thing is that already we don't have the same understanding. We don't have the same words when we come to the action. Climate, you're right, it was, it was good because climate has been pushing on climate ambition, climate action. Okay, what does that mean? Across system, what does that mean? In terms of narrative, there's one narrative which is imperative and urgent for all of us, humanitarian, peace, climate actors, and so on, is um, resilience. And resilience, what does that mean? That is managing multiple risks and impacts across system, whether it's on water, whether it's on food, energy, um, um, shelter, this is very important, and there is one thing that uh, I really advocate for. We have this UN Common Guidance on Resilience. It gives you the justification on the climate action, on the conflicts, on the disasters, on the epidemics, all these that are cascading into one another. This is a common agenda focusing on the risk management, not only on the response. Yes, we must meet the, the urgent needs, but managing these risks, all of our action must be risk sensitive, risk informed, and in this case, we're talking about climate risk. And then you can have a pull down menu of solutions which are out there. You have the social protection, you have the insurance, you have the nature-based solution, you have the risk-proofing of infrastructure, um, and, and you, you can add on to this suite. You have the early warnings, you have the anticipatory action, emergency response also, and then you have this pull-down menu of all the suite of actions where we are all more or less specialists or not, but this is we need to have this as our common agenda, understanding, and all of us on this climate crisis, we must all be informed by the climate risks, driven by climate risk, especially for the adaptation and resilience. But as you said, uh, Catherine, pre mitigation is a priority. The finance, volume of finance, is not going to be enough already for staying within the 1.5 degree. We're already losing this. And therefore, we should not be fighting as humanitarian actors for getting more of the climate finance, because most finance must go into mitigation, for sure. Because the adaptation and mitigate in the, the resilience um, and humanitarian needs are growing exponentially. So uh, I'll stop here, but common narrative, essential. Thanks. Azman, I know you already have points, so I'll, I'll let yes. you go ahead. Uh, uh, most of the questions have been uh, responded very well by my colleagues. Uh, just, just one question from the back of the hall on, on the scale of interventions. Yes, we do, we do understand that having a very small intervention in a very local area <coughs> cannot solve the problem for the entire globe. But at least that small intervention, if it is focused on climate change adaptation could be replicated in similar contexts elsewhere and we can, uh, we can sort of uh, create a momentum of those adaptation measures. I'm not going to the politics of whether more funds should go to the adaptation or more <laughs> funds should, should go to the mitigation. But uh, on this question of Noura, like when, when we when we say localized or locally led response, so we don't, we don't mean that the funds should go to the bank accounts of the local NGOs. By locally led, and when we, when we ask the donors that we need a sort of flexible funding and multi-year funding, so again, we are not asking those funds for ourselves. By locally led, we mean that the local communities who are getting impacted by various disasters, they should be leading the response. And by flexibility, 
when we ask for flexibility and funding. So again, like giving one example from, from this flood uh, response of 2022, the floods hit us in July and August and, uh, and when uh, organizations were making their proposals for the humanitarian actions, there were areas then when uh, it was too hot and there were so many mosquitoes and the people like needed, we call it fans, some people call it blowers, they, they, should, they might have put it in their proposals. But the funding would be reaching there, like they asked in July and the funding reaches there in January or February when it is too cold there, it is already winter there. So by the flexibility we mean, like if we want flexibility in our funding, we want it to be, to be responsive to the evolving needs of the communities. And that, 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 uh, thank you so much for uh, your questions. I've been told we have to wrap up. <laughs> I mean, I think we can continue this conversation for a while, but this is, there are many moments that we can, I think, come back to this. I have maybe quick fire, one last uh, thought before we leave on, you know, what is the takeaway on this conversation that we've had for yourself, but maybe for all of us, as be it from the climate sector, you know, you're coming from FAO that has a multi-hatted mandates that you're, you know, juggling. You coming from a very local perspective, obviously, but also what's our message to, to, to everybody else? Isaiah, you know what you have to say. <laughs> and then I'd, I'd go to Catherine Loon. Just maybe so that we kind of have a, a quick round of, you know. Uh, so, so, some friend asked whether this is sort of four time nexus or five time nexus or six time nexus. And then we had our friends here uh, on respecting the boundaries. Uh, by nexus, we don't mean that uh, everything would be done by just one actor or two actors. From the perspective of the local communities, it doesn't make a difference to me as an affected community member whether my needs are taken care of in a sustainable manner by one actor or by five actors. As, as affected community, as the community members who do get impacts of the climate change, the, as community members, we do need that the problems should be solved in such a manner that we do not need humanitarian assistance the next monsoon season and again in the next monsoon season. So I don't know how the Geneva and New York level discussion goes on. Like five actors come on a table, they decide, or 20 actors come and sit on a table and they decide. But the communities do need that their needs should be resolved in such a manner where they do not need the humanitarian assistance and their needs are met in, in a dignified manner. Thank you. Thank you. The, the, my wish is through this conversation, um, all of us, uh, whatever hat we have on, um, the climate crisis is here. It's overwhelming already. It's going to grow. Um, we are all, like the Fiji climate champion said, we are all in a small canoe together. And we need to understand one another, not compete, um, and serve the needs of those most vulnerable and at risk and affected. So. We, we must be, as humanitarian, here is really humanitarian, we must be the whistleblower. We must amplify the voice of those people that are suffering already today. In our case, it's the hungry one, but it's not only those ones. And, and in any occasion, we have to do that. And this is why we need the humanitarian actors at the table on the climate crisis to amplify those voices of those local people who cannot be in these global events or regional or national events with us, and to 
voice the imperative of the action on mitigation, climate change mitigation, but adaptation and resilience all together with all the suite of tools, focusing on the risks and not just on the response. This is very important that this advocacy and this strong a sense of urgency is um, done by all of us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we managed to mobilize 14 trillion for COVID. There's a lot of this that comes down to political will. Developed countries need to do more. They need to do more now, and we need to make sure we use public taxpayers' money in the most effective way possible to deal with the crisis we have. Uh, it is possible. The IPCC are clear that there is enough money to do this. We need the political will and, and, and the expertise and put our heads together to put it in the right places. I will speak as a member of ICFA. We no longer have the luxury to imagine that climate and the climate crisis will be handled by folks called climate justice people out there. We have to learn and learn quickly. It is possible. The way we learn resilience, the way we learn gender justice, the way we learn human rights and how we applied it in our sector is something that we know it's possible. So we need to learn, we need to pick up uh, ourselves and get to understand what this climate crisis means for our sector and for the populations we serve. One particular thing we would like, I think is important for us to learn, which has been developed by the climate justice movement, is this concept of climate justice. And when you talk about mitigation, emissions reduction, it, it, it paints an entirely different picture. What's happening in Malawi now with the tropical um, cyclone, cannot be sorted out by mitigation necessarily by Malawians. Mitigation means the emitters should cut their greenhouse gases. And those are not Malawis and Somalias and Yemens of this world. So we need to learn and underpin our action on climate justice as well, which is not a humanitarian principle, by the way. So in addition to humanitarian <laughs> principles, we need to consider other concepts like climate justice. And the last thing I would like to say is found our actions on the science. You might know that the Intergovernmental intergovernment Panel on Climate Change has been releasing their findings in installments, and I think the final one will come out, the synthesis report comes out on Monday. Yep. A lot of our climate action is science-based. A lot of the policy has been science-based, and so this is something we need to move towards as well. So absolutely, we gotta get into it, and we can no longer say, in the next conference, I, I don't want you to introduce it by saying nobody knows much about climate change here. Let's begin at the elementary level. No, we have to pick up our, our socks and get there. Thank you. I'm very happy to come last so I can reinforce I agree with everything here. <laughs> no, no, I'm happy with everything said. I reinforce the fact because you're absolutely right in terms of you need to work at the nexus and there I think we need to appreciate the complementarity of the various organizations in the system because we don't all do the same thing but that complementarity allows for a very good response. The only thing I would add is if you've not signed the Climate and Environment Charter for humanitarian organizations, you should. Thank you. I think on that note, please do sign the Climate and Environment Charter for humanitarian organizations. It's a, it's a start to actually start within ourselves, our own organizations, our own actions to see how can we do better, be it with parts of mitigation, which is environment sustainability, or looking at you know, how do we build resilience of our own organizations, our communities especially, on the ground to face the increasing climate impacts. Uh, but saying that, I think we have had a really interesting conversation. I think we can really, there's so much still to, to unpack. We have a coffee break now, which you can grab hopefully some of our speakers and continue to the discussion if they're around. And please don't hesitate to, to you know, come back to us if you, need, if you have any further questions and want to continue this discussion again. Thank you.